Hello and welcome to 1984 of the H series. We are now very close to the 2000. A uh, sheer mirror 16. <laughs> Only a whopping 16. <laughs> What do we say about that? Isn't it incredible? That could be done two times in seven days. We could do that. And today, the 22nd of December, we're also having sunshine here. It's been a while and there is really whiteness everywhere. Completely white. So this is going to be a white Christmas in every respect. And I will continue with Eugene Fisher. It's a fun thing. I listened to a lecture and there was a mentioning in Sweden of a famous painter. Uh, but I didn't realize because she said Princess Yuyi. And I had no idea what it was about. But that was her pronunciation of uh, Prince Yu Eugen. It's called the Painting Prince in Sweden. Mona Prinsen. Prince Eugen. Beautiful name. I will also mention the book 1984, the prediction year in the book from 1948 by George Orwell. Well, completely fantastic. The Ministry of uh, Truth and all that is very close to the problems Wittgenstein exposes in language. There are no strict philosophical problems. They are intermingled into each other. So the monstrous ideas in 1984 is exactly a black box idea. That you can change reality by changing the words. Doesn't, doesn't take in use. If you all of a sudden say this word has another meaning, all its accumulated use is not taken into consideration at all. It is an important factor and needs to be addressed as well. Not to be overlooked in any way. Last time we looked at what will happen if you sprang into the black box, the scarabee, or any other of these massive mistakes. We spoke about how how did Evans and Georg Henrik von Richt go about Ayer and Barclay. So to simplify the whole thing, you either get stranded in some absolute reductive thought. It's just out there. We are only visitors. We have nothing to do with the outer reality whatsoever. Uh, I'd say that's 99% of the population today. Ayer is a variety of that. Then you only have sense data. So he takes it one step further. He actually thinks the whole thing through a bit. Still the same problem, though. <laughs> but a bit better. Then we have Bishop Barclay. Complete idealism. The understanding from Wittgenstein saves us from these grave mistakes, from where there is no escape whatsoever. You will dig yourself further and further into the platonic cave until there is no light, air, 
or nothing will remain. These are also the views of David Chalmers, Daniel Dennett, Richard Dawkins, Stephen Hawking, to name a physicist. There are some, Stephen Weinberg. Um, most definitely Bertrand Russell. He took all of these views at the same time. Better safe than sorry. Bring them all in. <laughs> then you will be much better off. <laughs> you got all the options still. Wittgenstein is the only one who goes deep enough to discover that there is a troublesome foundation. We never noted, nobody wrote about it. No one has ever noted it before him. And the most of his own life, he didn't know about it either. I'd say those are one of the things that makes it even more so interesting. So we pay thanks to Wittgenstein, otherwise we'd be stranded either as von Richt, Ayer, or Bishop Barclay. And none of these things are quite tempting, appetizing. They're rather horrible, to be honest. Not a nice place to be. I will continue now on page 77. The pursuit of Wittgenstein's aim. The philosophical theories we have considered at the end suggest a further hypothesis also a related but distinct therapeutic aim more similar to Wittgenstein's own may frequently be relevant and is actually being pursued by philosophers who do not share Wittgenstein's conception of philosophy. Philosophy, philosophy. Philosophy. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> For consider, where philosophers respond to reconciliation problems with theories that clearly remain all too embryonic and accept these theories' core claims without making efforts to obtain warrant for maintaining them they do not, in fact, pursue the aim of establishing truths, empirical or conceptual, and obtaining knowledge a posteriori or a priori. where they merely care to show that different beliefs they feel compelled to hold might, contrary to, the, to first appearances, be both true. They mainly want to reassure themselves of the consistency of their beliefs Consistency. Consistency and coherency for all, Kurt Girdle. 
he also was in a pickle <laughs> or a jam <laughs> of their beliefs to put an end to the dissatisfactory state of feeling torn between different beliefs that strike them as inconsistent. Torn. <laughs> the main aim is, in other words, to put an end to states of cognitive dissonance. Tension like tension states like the disquiet Wittgenstein felt so keenly. Felt so keenly. But emotionally less intense. Emotionally less intense. <laughs> <laughs> In response to reconciliation problems, philosophers who describe their subject as, as a search for truth in quest of knowledge may practice it rather differently as an effort to overcome states of cognitive Dissonance. Indeed, in response to one specific family of such problems, this aim is quite commonly pursued and acknowledged explicitly skeptical arguments or paradoxes derive the conclusion that we cannot gain knowledge of a sort we commonly think we possess from assumptions that appear to be in line with common convictions and thereby appear to bring out an inconsistency in our common beliefs. Whence we ask, how is it possible for us to know? To know. And want an answer that shows these beliefs consistent. 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 <laughs> consistent. Consistent. <laughs> Many philosophers find this worrying. Not that the skepti skeptical conclusions might, after all, be true. But there appears to be an inconsistency between beliefs we feel unable to give up. Give up! <laughs> Give up. Give up. <laughs> the therapeutic aim of overcoming this state of cognitive dissonance is explicitly acknowledged by all those who explicitly seek to dispel the skeptical worry. Some efforts made in pursuit simultaneously 
its uh, cognitive aims. Cognitive aims. Cognitive aims. Where are you? Cognitive aims. Cognitive aims. Aims. Is Learned like the acquisition of conceptual knowledge. Conceptual knowledge. Conceptual knowledge. Others merely serve to dispel the boring impressions impression of inconsistency between beliefs we cannot abandon like diagnostic attempts to show that the assumptions of skeptical arguments are not as natural or trivial as they appear and not identical, but at odds with common convictions. Common convictions. As with skeptical with other paradoxes, where reconciliation problems are conceptualized as paradoxes. 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 <laughs> the aim of overcoming states of cognitive dissonance is frequently pursued and explicitly acknowledged. Acknowledged. in response to many other reconciliations, reconciliation problems. It is an important philosophical aim among others. Others, others, others. The non-cognitive approach Wittgenstein pioneered then constitutes an alternative means for achieving this end. This alternative is more effective and reasonable than the traditional remedy of reconciliatory theories. Up we go, Kale. Where the reconciliation problems at issue are ill-motivated and formulated in the grip of urges to misunderstand <laughs> as a remedy for cognitive dissonance thus induced Wittgenstein's approach is more effective because it addresses the causes, exposes and weakens the inferential urges that have us ex exposed the apparently conflicting beliefs.
where the theories belabor the symptoms. Accept these beliefs which they seek to show compatible. More importantly, Wittgenstein's alternative is more reasonable in the cases indicated. where we lack all warrant for at least one of the apparently conflicting beliefs, the conflicting beliefs. The non-cognitive approach has us establish this lack and helps us to give helps us to give up the belief where reconciliatory theories led us to uphold what we have no right to maintain. To maintain. And up we go. And result, results and context, context. context. The present paper developed Wittgenstein's account of nature and genesis of the problems that worried him. We conceptualize these as pseudo problems of a hitherto little understood kind. Very important, very good. Hitherto little understood kind. Never mentioned before, and they are little understood as ill motivated. Reconciliation problems generated by autonomous and a rational inferential urges. 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 <laughs> Their ill motivated nature warrants therapeutic aims, one of Wittgenstein, one of which Wittgenstein actually pursues. The genesis makes necessary a therapeutic approach, which employs non-theoretical methods. There is reason to believe that a significant number of familiar and important philosophical problems are, are of this kind, that a significant number of philosophers addressing them pursue a therapeutic aim with or without realizing, without realizing, I'd say, I'd say. Realizing. <laughs> <laughs> realizing, realizing, zingo. The drink. The at first sight puzzling non cognitive approach Wittgenstein pioneered thus emerges 
as the deliberate pursuit of a common, a frequently unacknowledged aim with more reasonable and effective methods in response to one particular kind of problem that warrants the end and calls for the means. Means. For means. the means. 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 We have thus given a reasonably detailed explanation of Wittgenstein's non-cognitive approach, vindicated it, and demonstrated that its philosophical relevance goes far beyond the small circle of usual suspects devoid of current interest. Suspects. Augustine on time, etc. To do this within the space of a single paper, we had to refrain from explicitly engaging with a secondary literature on Wittgenstein. The reader might, however, find convenient a rough outline of our results relate to extant therapeutic interpretations of his work and might humor being referred to Wisniewski 2003 for a review of other therapeutic philosophical projects Then second, I would like to deploy those results to provide a final argument against interpretations that fail to take seriously Wittgenstein's statements of his therapeutic aims and non-theoretical methods. Georg Henrik von Richt and Skomp et al. <laughs> As we have seen, the guiding aims pursued are constitutive of therapy. Therapy. <gasps> therapy. 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 Hence, philosophical work is literally a form of therapy just in the case the philosopher at issue primarily pursues with it the aim of putting an end, a to unwarranted emotions that are disabling, distressing, or disquieting. B. To unreasonably behavior that is dysfunctional. Dysfunctional. What a word. Dysfunctional. 
accordingly an interpretation which describes a philosopher's work as therapeutic will qualify as literally therapeutic just in case it attributes to him at least one such guiding aim. One such guiding aim. By contrast, it will be metaphorical just in case it credits him only with different aims that can be labeled therapeutic only in a metaphorical sense. and ambiguous just in case it attributes to the philosopher both therapeutic and other aims without subordinating the latter to the former. This provides us with a helpful system for classifying therapeutic interpretations of Wittgenstein's work. <laughs> work. Classifying therapeutic interpretations. Oh, yo, 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 yo. <laughs> By its lights, most of those interpretations that describe Wittgenstein's work as therapeutic at all, and not merely, for instance, as non-theoretical or confessional, are metaphorical Confessional. Shh, confessional. 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 Shh. <laughs> Father. <laughs> I have sinned. Father, I have sinned. Well, five Hail Mary and two Paternoster. <laughs> you are relieved, my son. <laughs> are metaphorical, yes. This includes both the major English and German language commenters on the investigations. And currently, most discussed therapeutic readings, commentators who described Wittgenstein as engaged in therapy, took him to thereby try to improve our understanding of everyday forms of speech and replace metaphysical pictures by more realistic accounts of reality of reality <laughs> reality <laughs> or 
or replace the hankering after an illusory by satisfaction with an available, available point of view on language. In these ways, therapy is to make us gay. 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 In response to philosophical questions, an overview of the pertinent facts and their connections. Which lets us acquire a true understanding of the question at issue. <laughs> and dispel or disentangle puzzles, confusions, or conceptual difficulties so as to win, win through to a special kind of understanding that would enable us to find our way about in the maze of perplexities. Perplexities! Wittgenstein's primary aim in philosophy is to help us work ourselves out of confusions we become entangled in when philosophizing. One, summing up the common ground of interpretations proposed by Carol McDowell, Diamond and Conant. In different ways, all these commentators develop the same underlying theme. The immediate aim of therapy is to improve our understanding of our concepts. This serves the intermediate aim of correcting conceptual fallacies and linguistic confusions, which in turn serves the ultimate aim of showing that from philosophical problems and doctrines really are nonsense or patent Falsehood! Falsehood! False. Hmm. I, ouch. Okay. All these are cognitive aims par excellence. Most scholars found it exceedingly difficult to recognize other non-cognitive aims. Even commentators who took Wittgenstein to proceed without theory construction and to address the person who suffers from philosophical bafflement. 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 <laughs> Bafflement. Philosophical bafflement. <laughs> the person who suffers from philosophical bafflement. Oh no, oh no. What a horrible disease. What a horrible disease. 
What can we do? The bafferment proceeds. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> went for many years no further than to say that he thereby sought to reveal points of tension and to lay bare conflicting and illegitimate applications of language doctor I saw the language Doctor, I suffer from philosophical bafflement. <laughs> the attribution of poor purely cognitive aims thus leads us to the view that the thrust of Wittgenstein's therapeutic work is entirely negative, aimed at nothing more and nothing less than a demonstration that philosophical doctrine is invariably the result of linguistic confusion. Confusion! Oh no, confusion. <laughs> this view has the merit of not regarding Wittgenstein's work as yet another excessively speculative and arguably incompetent attempt to compete with science. But it does confront us with the question of why, why such a purely negative enterprise should be worth undertaking the answer most strongly suggested by Wittgenstein's old remarks is that it is worthwhile only for people who truly suffer from truly the, suffer truly suffer <laughs> from the philosophical bafflement thus relieved and engage in this enterprise with the aim of liberating themselves from the intellectual disquiet that torments them. Torments them! Doctor, I really suffer from philosophical bafflement. Torments! And it's 10 days off. Torments! Recognition of this therapeutic alongside with the cognitive aims mentioned led to a few ambiguous interpretations. This paper by contrast adds to the handful of really literal interpretations that recognize the primacy of therapeutic aims and credit Wittgenstein with different methods. 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 These methods are to be distinguished not only from those metaphorical and ambiguous interpretations of Wittgenstein's therapeutic approach, but also from a series of studies that seize conversely on Wittgensteinian ideas in order to clarify 
psychoanalytic therapy. One of those guiding aims of both potentially pertinent kinds, pertinent kinds, namely in the course of a potentially misleading comparison with ancient skepticism, the primary concern of both Wittgenstein and the Pyrrhonist is not philosophical truth. But the relief of conceptual suffering. Suffering. Suffer. I suffer. Suffering. Conceptual suffering. Both maintain that philosophy is an unnecessary encumbrance on human life, putting an end to both that suffering and this waste of effort is their shared motivation and teleology. The other literal interpretations take Wittgenstein's, Wittgenstein to seek merely relief from distress or disquiet. It's quiet. <laughs> quiet. <laughs> Ferrell attributes to Wittgenstein and his pupils the guiding aim of resolving philosophical tension states which he conceptualizes as anxiety states with a specific kind of cause, of cause, of course. Psychological theory here has been insufficiently general, for it tended to regard neurosis and anxiety states as caused by nonverbal factors alone, alone. The Wittgensteinian contribution consists in an extension of the notion of anxiety states and their treatment to cover the cases where the condition is produced in part by the ordinary verbal habits of the person himself. It is these habits that in certain people produces the conflicting states known as philosophical puzzlement. Philosophical puzzlement. Also, Gordon Baker attributes to Wittgenstein the main purpose of providing therapy for individuals, troubled states of mind. Troubled states of mind.
Beunruhigungen. Beun, beunru, <laughs> Beunruhigungen. And takes the real problems Wittgenstein addresses to be such worries. On Wittgenstein's distinct conception of philosophical problems, they are individuals' troubled states of mind, which have as their intentional objects particular conceptual confusions, tensions, paradoxes, or puzzles. A philosophical problem is an individual's internal conflict. Unusual enough to put a stop there. 1984. The 22nd of December. Conflict is the last word. Conflict. Internal conflict. Even better. Conflict. Nine, Pursuit of Wittgenstein's Aim, page 77, if you may, Kalle could you please? In these ultimate hours before Christmas Eve, four days, some days ahead. If you go down to the bottom here, it's a rather long sentence. I will try to bring it together. We ask ourselves question, whence we ask at the end there, how is it possible for us to know? I mentioned before empirical ideas and epistemological problems, thereby most pertinently the Gettier problem so we start wonder how do we know how how do we get that sense state that, that makes it possible for me inside my head to store that knowledge how do i get hold of it how do i know it's true and not false and i'd say modern day man is obsessed by that with this exceedingly exaggerated news consumption we have people are wondering is it true or false making nonsensical unnecessary thinking for that reason wasting energy for nothing it's not pertinent it doesn't make a difference what makes a difference is how does it work what's the doing what on earth is the action? Why do you merely ask if it's true out in the air, transcendentally or whatever? That makes little if no sense. And I'd say here we know why we left the right hemisphere and went to the left hemisphere. The reason is, obviously, we leave the real world, so to speak. I'm making citation marks here. What do I mean? Well, if we do not interact with the world, have criterion, we have no 
action, doing, we are leaving reality. This is exactly what the left hemisphere prefers or does, better put, does. The left hemispheric tendency is to neglect both the body, the inner, your own thinking, and the outer. So we have now found the cure for left hemisphere dominance. It is the same as believing in the black box. I'd say it's an unavoidable problem that leads to the left hemisphere. Dominance. Empty concepts, does it sound like the left hemisphere? Having no contact with reality, does it sound like the left hemisphere? Resounding yes. So better than the suggested Fisher thing here with therapeutic, why not call it the segue going from the left to the right? This is what Wittgenstein does or help with. He shows the way to regain reality. And the philosophical problems, all the paradoxes that they've all, Kurt Gödel and many others, they get ear problems, it's just one among 20. That haunts us. Even ordinary people will be haunted by that will also lead to that, like Kurt Gödel Hill, that we try to understand the world from the already past logic and rules. Sort of stale thinking, using Newton as it has already been used in him. When he did it, it was fresh. When an engineer does it, it's fresh. But it's not fresh to do it more and more and over and over again. And we do it a priori. We say that there are physical laws in the universe before even checking. We don't know it and we enforce them to the world with the grid aggressively. You go to page, I don't have numbers, 78, 79, 79, please. There is something like seven lines down. Seven lines down. <laughs> Accordingly, an interpretation which describes a philosopher's, philosopher's works as therapeutic will qualify as literally therapeutic, just in case it attributes to him at least one such guiding aim. I say, replace that with a segue to the right hemisphere and replace the illness or the disquietude with what erupted, we know now from E. Mekirkus in the 18th century, lack of humor, boredom, depression, autism, schizophrenia. This lack of balance bodily and slash mentally, body and mind unbalanced, lacking the spiral, having no direction, because there's no longer any free will. It's a stalemate. And we are left with the, an afterthought. We are left with a Saussurian afterthought. Like having Lego, which you no longer can play with and, <laughs> and make new things with. This is what is possible with Wittgenstein.
and we, we can do, we can infuse concepts, we can infuse analyst, analyzation, intellectualization with freshness. It will be new. It will not be the old. It will be a pretty much difference as a spice to everything. And thereby, we energize the whole situation by a directionality. Once more, the spiral goes somewhere. It has a direction. Well, I leave it to Kali here to come in. Thank you. On the same page, 79. 79. Um, rela relating into therapeutic, if it's metaphorical or not. Uh, and we can think about Wittgenstein's work during World War II. Uh, during World War II, Wittgenstein volunteered to work in a pharmacy and then oh, in a hospital. A pharmacist, yeah. So he literally worked in therapy. Hmm. So, yes, absolutely. And we can, therefore, we have to agree with Fisher therapeutic is significant mm. uh, Wittgenstein, both biographically, but also in his work, philosophical work. Mm. But where, but how should we understand this therapy? Um, Fisher says here on the same page. Uh, so he says that uh, philosopher at issue primarily pursues with the aim of putting an end. Let me see. Uh, let me see. The guiding aims pursued are constitute of therapy. Hence, philosophical work is literally a form of therapy. Just in case the philosopher at issue primarily pursues with the aim of putting an end, A, to unwarranted emotions that are disabling, distressing, or disquieting, B, to, to reasonably behave that is dysfunctional. So I think this is uh, how Fisher views philosophy. Uh, so uh, in my opinion, uh, um, Fisher puts down emotions, so to say, at the expense of reason. Um, reasons. And I say that also that Uh, he paints a picture of a stoic philosopher that is with uh, Fisher's ideal, I would say. And, uh, and this is also a reason of behavior that is also, I don't know, you, you have to be a stoic. It's, you should be always calm. I think this is the implicit image of Fisher of the ideal philosopher um, and let me see also here uh, I might Fisher might say that I misunderstood him because here he says that um, um, the primary concern of what Wittgenstein the Pyrrhonist is not philosophical truth but really for conceptual suffering both maintain that philosophy is an unnecessary Incomparance on human life. Um, putting an end to, to both that suffering and this waste of effort is their shared motivation. Oh, yeah, it's it's effort, yeah. Endless effort. <laughs> mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, here, uh, so with uh, Fisher is here to say <clears throat> disagree with this view of, uh, of, of, of Wittgenstein. Nevertheless, Although Fisher seems to dispel this view of this that Wittgenstein was a Pyrrhonist, I think he still embraces, embraces it. Uh, it's like here about anxiety. Um, so anxiety is also something negative. Um, so I don't know, Hans, if you would agree with me that Fisher's ideal of 
uh, if it's a view of Wittgenstein is that he's a stoic philosopher or that should be the aim of a philosopher or do I misunderstand Fischer? Yeah, Fischer is being really vague there actually. It could be as you say, uh, but he's, 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 not, he's not putting too much pressure on that thing. Mm. Uh, yeah. yeah, possibly, but... Uh, uh, what, what did you think of my idea of uh, mm. the left-right hemisphere as a, a sort of <laughs> take on Wittgenstein? It could be yeah. the same way into the right hemisphere. No, uh, 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 the left hemisphere would do, probably would say that emotions are something negative. Mm, yeah, yeah. Like for uh, Descartes. For Descartes, uh, I think that is... Uh, Left, uh, left side of the brain prefers. Oh yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah, that r the rational is the the stoic philosophy. The geometrical and the X Y Z and all that. Yes, while the right side of the brain embraces emotions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like uh, that is the spice of life. Let's say emotions. You could put there, like say music, the arts. And I think Something that extra stuff. we do in between, but not really important. <laughs> yes, for the left. Correctly, side. okay. <laughs> uh, so, so I, I, for me, I, I say Fisher is so to say. Hmm. He, he wants to be calm, as calm as possible. Everything, <laughs> even if the uh, house is on fire, you should be calm. <laughs> That is Fischer's idea of Wittgenstein. You remember we had something on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah I remember in the beginning. I, I really ah, like, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 here, uh, when a psychologist teaches firemen how to pet a cop with fear in financial distress. So, uh, so, for Fischer, Fischer, uh, he has two ideas. The soy philosopher and mm. the psychologist. Uh, so he paints, he thinks that um, Wittgenstein is a Freudian, psycho a mm. Freudian psychologist. Uh, well, I, I, I'm not sure he means a Freudian, but yeah, but sure, yeah, psychologist of some sort, yeah. Mm. And oh, how very interesting, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, so I, to... I, I was just wondering mm. if me and Michael Chris is aware of this tendency in Wittgenstein, if I'm even right, I don't know. But mm -hmm. I see it. I see sort of a connection here, which is maybe possible to investigate further. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, mm -hmm. let me see in the beginning. Ah, yes. Uh, so uh, the cognitive aim. We, we discussed this in the beginning. What is really the cognitive, non non cognitive? Let me see. Ah, here. I think this is important to take away. Leave non cognitivism has usually been reserved for positions like expressivism in ethics, which claim that several statements are non truth apt. The present paper will show that replacement of cognitive by other aims for philosophical work is reasonable also where we are systematically driven to make statements. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, that's good, yeah, yeah, I see that. So, this is uh, are not truth up. So, what is meant here? Um, it doesn't have, uh, it's not right and wrong, it doesn't have false and truth, Max, no, right and wrong is uh, mm. true or false. Yes, here we can agree with Fischer that uh, you cannot read Wittgenstein as right or wrong. Mm. Yeah, uh, yeah, sure, yeah, let's end <laughs> what you say, Kalle. Yes, let's end there. Thank you very much, Kalle Lundov, for your nice comments. Thank you, everyone, for listening in. Have a very nice morning, day, or afternoon, wherever you are. Bye-bye for now. Wait here. I need to stop the recording first. There. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.